But let's open our Bibles to the Gospel by Matthew, chapter 4. As you're turning there, what we're looking at this morning is the, the simplest definition in the Bible of who we are this morning. Uh, if I was to go around and, and ask you who you are, some of you would say, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer. Uh, others of you would say that I'm born again. Others of you would say that, that I'm a worshiper of God. What, what's amazing, when Jesus inaugurated his ministry, he reduced down the entire gospel call to two words, follow me. And he described Christianity as a life where he's in front and we're behind and we are following him. And he is a person, he has a way, in fact, he himself is, right? John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way. And so we who follow him, follow him down the way. And that's why the book of Acts calls Christians followers of the way. They were those who were of the way. They were following Christ, following Christ. And Jesus said, I'm the truth. So the truth that leads us to follow him, the, the life that, in, that follows this truth of the way is Jesus Christ. And that's what the simplest definition of who we are as believers is followers of Christ. We are following him. In fact, last night I was, um, I was sitting, getting to know a group of people. There were 500 people at this banquet in Lansing that, that Bonnie and I were sitting uh, at a table of 10 of them, and we're, you know, just trying to be polite and kind and get to know everybody around you, and gradually, you know, the, the Bible, the gospel somehow gets woven in the conversation. It's so interesting to hear how people describe their relationship to God. Some of them say, oh, I've prayed that, or others say, I've done that. Others say, oh, I've joined the church, or uh, a very common, I've been baptized. But what I was trying to find out at my table, at least, is are you following Christ? Either you are or you're not. Following is intentional. It's a choice. It's conscious. If you're following someone from this service, you, you would walk behind them to their car. If you're going somewhere after the service and someone says, follow me, you know, and you don't know where they live or you don't know where they're going, you would intentionally keep your eye on them and you'd follow them. And, and that, this morning, either we are or we're not. Either we are following Christ or we're not. Specifically, we follow the path. See, Jesus left a path. The way is a path. It's, it's a way marked out. Remember, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to the, the path. See, there's a path. Uh, in fact, Psalm 1611 says, thou wilt show me the path of life. The, the Christian life is, is not, uh, my father used to lead expeditions in way up in Canada, I mean remote expeditions. He was an outfitter. And, and he would, he had this, this kind of like a little mini machete, and he would mark the trees. Because they were in off the maps, no GPS, no Google yet. And, and they would mark so that you could always see the next marking. And coming back, you followed that path. We don't go through life hacking around trying to figure out where we are in the wilderness of life. There's already a path. And there's already someone we're following, a guide. And Christianity is not doing that or praying that or joining that or being baptized. It's a relationship where we know who it is we're following. And we, by faith, have chosen to follow me, Jesus said. That's who a Christian is. So let me show you that, starting in chapter 4. Uh, look at verse 19. The simplest description of what we are as Christians comes from Christ's first call to those first disciples in Matthew 4, 19. In this verse, Jesus explains the new life he was offering, the salvation that he was going to purchase on the cross, and the gospel of repentance. That, that's what it says. He went from there on preaching repentance. Uh, that's, that's what he says uh, uh, on down as you read. But in verse 19, the initial call was for them to follow me. Simple. Two words. 
He reduces everything down to those two words. This two-word call summarizes the simple yet hard choice that had to be made. You see, we were all born not following him, not even wanting to follow him, not even knowing him to follow. In fact, Isaiah says that all of us metaphorically are like sheep. And the problem with all of us is that we've all gone our own way. We want our own way. In fact, the basic underlying deepest problem all of us have, we want our own way. That causes every conflict, every disagreement, every relational problem, every single sin comes back to us wanting our way. And it's an emanation and a display of pride that, that my way is most important. And, and that's what God diagnoses us as, as followers of ourself. And, and Christianity is the hard choice because we know Jesus has called, offered to us the pathway, and either we surrender, yield, choose by faith to follow him, or we don't. So this morning, if you're a Christian, you're a follower. If you're not a follower, you're not a Christian. Because Jesus defines a Christian as a follower of him, of Christ. There are degrees of following Christ as believers uh, all throughout history, this morning, and for all of time in Revelation 2 and 3, all different types of following. There are those that follow Christ closely. There are those that follow distantly. I mean, you, they're almost out of sight. They're, they're following, but they're way back there. There are those that follow sporadically. I mean, I've gone in caravans, even with my family, you know, two cars, and, and one of my children, uh, I'll, I'll notice in the rearview mirror that they're right on my bumper, and then they're about a mile back, and they come right back on my bumper, and then they're about a, two miles back, and then they're right back. And it's sporadic, but it, they follow. And, and there are Christians like that, Christians that follow Christ at a distance, Christians that you know, that are right there. I mean, you, you can actually see their eyes in the rearview mirror. You know, they're just close. And th there are degrees of following Christ, but there can be no doubt. If you're following someone, it's intentional. It's a choice. Follow me. So just think for a minute. You know, if you were sitting at my table of 10 last night, and I said, um, are you Christian? What would you say? Oh, yeah, I've, I prayed that. Oh, uh, yeah, I went forward. I joined. I've been baptized. I'm a member of the church. None of those things explain true salvation. True salvation is my sheep hear my voice, they know me, and they follow me. Are you following Jesus Christ this morning? Now, now watch how often he describes that. You're in Matthew 4, 19. I'll read it to you. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now skip over to chapter 8. Go four chapters to the right. Chapter 8, verse 22 in the Gospel by Matthew. And uh, now Jesus has just talked about the cost of discipleship with this person uh, that was considering following Christ. And they said, but... but you know, I've got to go bury my father. And, and look what Jesus says in verse 22. Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Now, a lot of people get stuck on that verse. Sounds like Jesus is an old meanie. You know, here's dad dead lying on the ground. Just leave him there to rot, you know. Don't bury him. Is that what he's saying? No. Dad was quite alive. This was the custom of the day that you did not get far away from the inheritance because it was so important. And this man was considering following Christ, but he knew that his father might disown him or not give him his big share if he did. And he said, I'm going to wait till dad dies. After I get the money, I'll follow you. After I get the wealth, I'll follow you. And Jesus said, why don't you let uh, those that don't want to follow me that want to stay around for the money, let them have the money. Why don't you come follow me? See, this was the call to giving up this world for the next, which you don't hear very, that's not a big one nowadays. Uh, used to be, but uh, nowadays we want both.
But Jesus said to him, follow me, let the dead bury their own dead. Keep going, cross the page to chapter 9, verse 9. And by the way, there are 16 of these in the Gospels. And there are the, the ones we're going through in the Gospel by Matthew. And I'm, I'm going to take you only to one outside of Matthew. But look at 9.9. This is the call of the author of the Gospel by Matthew, Matthew himself. And Jesus passed on from there, Matthew 9.9, and saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. He was sitting right by the Roman road. Roman soldiers were there. Everybody came down the road, had to stop. And he looked them over and analyzed and gave them their tax bill. And so here he was, Mr. CPA, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Jesus said to him, those two words, follow me. And look at the, look at the choice. So he arose and followed him. Wow. I mean, simple call, difficult call. Look at chapter 16. That's the next one, verse 24. Uh, Jesus uh, is ongoing toward the cross, teaching them and preparing them for what's going to happen. And uh, Jesus said in verse 24 to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, anybody wants to be one of my, uh, you know, followers, one of those that, that is coming after me, he said to them, let him deny himself. So it's a hard choice. Take up his cross. It's an ongoing price. And there it is. And follow me. It isn't merely enough to, to say, I did that. It's whether or not you're following. It's not enough to say, oh yeah, it's I am a Christ follower today. I'm follow I might follow sporadically. I might follow distantly. I might follow earnestly, closely. But I know and have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And his grace is causing me, my new heart, wants to follow him. I want to be behind him. I want to be following his way. I want to be on his path. Here's the last one, chapter 19. It's one of the saddest ones. Chapter 19, verse 21. Um, this this uh, account, uh, is, is, if you put the other version of it together, it's amazing how you weave it together. This is the most earnest seeker of Christ mentioned in all of the scriptures. This guy runs in front of everybody, loudly proclaiming, sliding in, in front of Jesus at his feet, that he wants eternal life. I mean, how would you like to go soul winning with people sliding in like into uh, a baseball game base before you saying, I want it. And I mean, wow. But look what Jesus says after a little discourse with him, um, that uh, he wanted to keep the commandments, verse 17. In other words, Jesus wanted to see if he thought he could, and he did think he could, and we can't keep the commandments apart from God's power, empowering grace. So he said to him, uh, um, the man says, which commandments keep? And Jesus says, murder and all of them. He takes them out of order and reverses them and everything. You, I'm not preaching on this, but look at verse 20. The young man said to him, I've done it all. He lacked the conviction of his own sinfulness. That was the problem. I've done it all. I've done it all. Okay, look at this. Jesus said, okay, if you want to be perfect, because only perfect people go to heaven, you have to be perfect like my Father in heaven, and it's imputed, and it's by justifying grace. But if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. What was that? That was making his decision impossible. Because Jesus knew this man had the idolatry of covetous materialism. He could not divest himself of his money. And so Jesus put up the ultimate roadblock, the test, to see if he wanted Christ more than his stuff. And you know the rest of the story. When the young man heard that, 22, he went away sorrowfully because he had great possessions. What was his problem? He lacked submission. He lacked conviction of his sin, but he lacked submission. What's the last part of verse 21 that I didn't read? Follow me. See, Jesus said, those who possess eternal life want me more than anything else. And they love me supremely. They want to follow me close, sporadically, distantly, earnestly, but they follow me. And and that's the simplest definition. So we could say, 
Hearing and following Christ is what starts at salvation. We hear his voice. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we hear Christ's voice in his word and we respond to his voice by following him. That's what salvation is. So let's go to outside of Matthew. Go to the last gospel, gospel by John chapter 10. And I know there's lots more. The, the follow Christ, there's 16 of them. Uh, someone said to me, I found more. I said, there are more. I only showed you a handful. But look at chapter 10, verse 27. That's the last follow me one. When we hear him follow Christ, it starts with salvation. Always remember one of the most powerful verses of assurance and blessing for us as believers comes from how Jesus describes salvation. Right here in 1027. This is the ultimate, when, when, when people want to know for sure, am I a possessor of life eternal? Do I have endless life? Are my sins forever gone? Listen to what Jesus says, John 10, 27. Got it? Let's all stand. This is our text this morning. So here you go, follow along. I'm going to read uh, verse 27 and also verse 28, and then we'll pray. John 10, 27. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Wow. I mean, that's the ultimate assurance verse. We hear his voice, respond in faith to follow him, and that's what commences our life in the way, our life on the path, our life following Christ. And the way we, Paul said it, as you receive the Lord by hearing and responding and following is how the rest of our Christian life is. Salvation only begins this following, this pathway walking, this way of Christ embracing. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, I thank you for the, the beauty of the words of our Lord Jesus that you had your Apostle John record for us. And I pray that each one of us here this morning would examine ourselves whether we're in the faith, the faith described in your word, the faith of hearing, me personally hearing your voice, convicted of my sins, aware of my sinfulness as the rich young ruler was, and, and submitting to your way so I will follow you. That is a work of your grace, and it's a miracle, and it's not anything I could do. But when it happens, it changes the complete direction of my life from the heart outward. I want to follow you. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that isn't quite there yet, they haven't started following you, I pray that your word as we study it this morning will, will convict and draw by your spirit them to yourself so that they will today become a follower who hears your voice. In the name of Jesus, we're asking all this. Amen, and you may be seated. As you're seated, salvation is when the good shepherd finds us. We weren't looking for him. I wasn't born looking for the Lord. I was born looking out for myself. In fact, I was saved in 1962, hiding, covering up, and blaming my sin on someone else. I was just like, Adam and Eve. As soon as they fell into sin, they hastily hid themselves in the bushes, made for themselves coverings, and stayed away from God. He had to come looking for them. That's always the way that God works. He initiates the recovery, the salvation, the coming to find us in our sin. And, and so that's how the Lord describes salvation. Salvation is when we're found by our good shepherd. We hear his voice. We forsake going our own sinful way. We begin the rest of our life listening for his voice and his word and following him. It's just the beginning of a life. That's why the reading of the word of God is so important. The more we hear his voice, the more we know the path, the more clearly it becomes, and the more we follow him. Amazing how it integrates together. 
Those who hear and follow Christ in the Bible are called believers. They're also called Christians. They're also called disciples. And by the way, as we turn back to Matthew 6, it was to those disciples Matthew 6 was written. You see, we often need help. I mean, wouldn't you like it if, if it was as clear how to follow the Lord as it is, you know, nowadays our government, tell, it used to be the food pyramid, now I think it's the food circle, I don't know what it is, but I do know it's on all the cereal boxes, you know, your minimum daily requirement, and you shouldn't exceed this and that and that, you know. They, now it, it used to be on the back, now it's on the front, you know, how much sugar, how much salt, how much whatever. Uh, Bonnie sent me, boy, I'm not good at shopping. She sent me all by myself to go and shop, and, and I was standing there, and, and I was overwhelmed at the fronts of the cereal boxes. I was just buying one, and I was starting to compare, you know, how many grams of sugar this one had and salt. I didn't even know they had salt and sugar in them, you know, and, and I was just, re I was, it, and then I get up there, and the lady said, poke the green button. I said, my wife doesn't let me out very often. I said, <laughs> uh, shopping, that is. I said, what do I do? And so, you know how they just turn around and do it for you, you know. And it, it was really fun, but I was amazed at how everything is marked for our health. How do we know about our spiritual health, our finding the pathway? You see, in chapter 6, the Lord left a prayer for his followers or disciples. The Lord's Prayer is actually the prayer for those who are his disciples, those who are following him. This prayer is what those who are following Christ confess every day they need. It's their needs. He says, I'm going to tell you a list of what you need to ask me for. Just request this. I will give it to you. If you're my follower, if you're on the path, this is what you need to stay on the path. This is what you need to know where you're going. Just ask me for it. I'll give it to you. And if you're my follower, this is what you're going to be asking for. It's so simple. In fact, the Lord knew most of us would not be hauling behind us a cart with all kinds of lexicons and, and, and deep, you know, uh, theologies. He reduced Christianity down to a simple thought, follow me, and a simple prayer of what a follower looks like. And he thought, you've got it all. And that's why, as I said weeks back, this, this was the first, the Lord's Prayer, was the first thing that was published in an extra-biblical kind of companion for the church. When they had the teachings, the Didache, this was right in there. And by the way, it had, in the second century, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Even though it's gotten out by the 16th century, it doesn't matter. That's my little reminder of why we even say that. But the Lord left a prayer for his followers, his disciples. The Lord's prayer is the prayer of those who follow him and what they confess. And so we could say this, the Lord's prayer is the gospel pathway. If you have, if you have been impacted by the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, you start and I start down the pathway, and that pathway is defined by this beautiful short passage of Scripture as the pathway that Jesus left for us who follow him in his gospel. And so each of the petitions of the Lord's Prayer are to us his disciples. And each of them mark an area that we're to confess or agree with God on every day as a need. And prayer is expressing how much we need the Lord. Your prayer level and my prayer level shows my awareness of how much I need him. When we pray, we reveal how much we realize how much God's help is necessary in our lives. The less we pray, the less conscious we are we need him. And the more we pray, the more we confess our need for God. But you notice the Lord's Prayer is plural. It's our Father. Give us. You see, what this is a description is not just me. See, that goes back to our me. It's our. As Christ's body all of us equally need these areas to be focused on. And it's part of the way we minister to one another. When you see someone in need, when you see someone struggling, when you see someone that, that you look in the mirror and they're further back from the Lord, you know, because you're following the Lord. Remember Paul said, follow the Lord like I am? And that's what we tell other people to do. But we're looking and we're saying, <laughs> hello, what are you doing way back there? They go, I don't know what to do. You say, but we're following him the same way. And, and it's our Father. Let me reintroduce you to what we're supposed to be doing. That's what each of these petitions, and let me get into them, because following 
uh, the pathway means, number one, we learn what it means to worship God. And, and I said it last week, and I'll say it every week. Worshiping God has nothing to do with the lights, has nothing to do with the environment, has nothing to do with any of the accoutrements. It is not attached to music, although music is an element. But it's never attached to music. Worship is focusing my heart, my life, and responding to the true and living God. And I can respond to him at work. I respond to him with my thoughts. I can respond to him with my voice. I respond to him with anything. But it is a response to the true and living God as defined in the scriptures. And that's what the first element is about. We follow the pathway of worshiping God. When we seek God as our Father, the one who is in heaven, the one who Jesus said already in chapter 5 up through where we are in 6 is the one sitting on the throne, the majesty on high, we have started to worship. When we stop every day to focus our hearts on who God is as our Father, and as we get focused on his character, that's the beginning of a life of worship. Now, remember I told you last night I was sitting in Lansing at this banquet. I was sitting next to a drastically wounded war veteran. And, and it was a privilege. I mean, to sit next to him, he was just radiating uh, veteran, veteran and, and he was talking about everything. And for 40 minutes, he described to me his challenges in life. And he said, on August 2nd, 2007, 827, he told me, he said, we were driving through Baghdad in our striker vehicle, and he described it with all the big tires and all the metal wrapping and the whole company was with him and there was a driver and they were going through and listening and following orders and directions and all of a sudden a buried massive mine that was detonated through a cell phone they drove along and as they parked to get ready for what they were doing and it totally destroyed this vehicle wrapping the steel around his legs I mean, he was actually sandwiched by the thing, instantly killing those around him. And what does he do? Opens the hatch, gets his gun out to protect. He didn't even know if they were alive or dead behind him. He isn't going to let the, the ambushers get any more of them. So here he is, I mean, profoundly. I mean, I, this is 10 minutes into the story. He goes 40. He went through every rod, screw, uh, addition, um, everything they did to him. Of course, I couldn't eat my meal after that. I mean, it was unbelievable what his body has gone through. But you know what he kept saying? Finally, he was rescued. He was in that twisted vehicle. The rescuers came, reached down in the hatch, and started tugging on him. He is attached to the striker vehicle. It's wrapped around him. They're going, ur, ur, before all the bad guys come. Ur, ur. Finally, they figure out they got to cut the whole, whole thing apart and cut the metal to get him out. And what he said to me, the only reason I'm telling you this story, he told it in 40, it took me two minutes to tell you that. He said, as they rescued me, he looked around at the devastation around him, and he said, why did I survive? Now, did you know... Have you ever played t-ball? T-ball is where they have this little thing um, and they put a ball on top of it and they put a little tyke with his little helmet on, his little bat, and they get him just the right distance from it and he can wildly swing it all he wants and he can keep swinging until he hits the ball off the tee. It's really fun. Love t-ball. Everybody hits the ball. If, if you cannot sit next to someone and listen to their challenges and they say, but why did I survive? That was my t-ball moment. And I got to just, of course, I got to tell him about the God who always loved him. God so loved the world. God's love is like, and, and by the way, I'm drawing this because I just did this with those kids when I was in New York, and I said, I told all of them, because you've got to keep, as a, you know, working with young people, you've got to keep them moving around, looking at stuff. And I said, look up at the roof. And oh boy, they all quickly looked up at the ceiling. And I said, that ceiling 
is underneath the roof, and the roof protects us. Nothing is going to land on you that doesn't go through that roof and ceiling. And over you right now is the God who always loves you. And so no, no evil will befall you that the one who loves you has not filtered or suppressed or hindered or kept you from. Nothing gets in to your vehicle that, that challenges your life except it gets through God's love. So, I mean, he was right with me there. He was listening intently. And I said, by the way, do you think that God knew where the bomb was, that you parked on it? He knew that. God always knows everything. He never discovers anything. He doesn't, it doesn't, he doesn't count things. He knows completely everything, completely at all times. That's his omniscience or his wisdom theologically speaking. He always knows. So, so God is sheltering us. Nothing gets to us except what, as a loving father, he allows. And nothing comes upon us unexpectedly. It's not like it fools him. It surprises him. He always knows. And then, these are just, when you worship God, you know his character. God always operates his father lovingly, knowingly, and presently. He is with us. He's not an absent father. He told me about how many years of reconstruction he's gone, and therapy. And by the way, he can walk. Unbelievable. They tried to, he said that he was in the, the whatever, the quick triage thing, and he said he had to argue with them because they said, you're so mangled, we're going to amputate. He said, you may not. And I didn't know that you had that conversation, you know. Uh, I've never had that. Don't cut it off, you know. Uh, but they responded, and they said, you don't know what you're getting into. He says, I do. God is with us in those challenges of life. He loves us. He knows us. He's present in the vehicle with us. Anything that comes in, whether it's a financial challenge that you don't know where the next dollar is coming from, whether it's a relational challenge, that person is turned on you or has always been bad, or that boss is unreasonable, or that teacher, that unreasonable teacher that, that's going to ruin your 4.0. God loves you so much, he allowed you to have that teacher. He knew that teacher was like that. Or that student is going to be a disruptor of the whole class and ruin all your goals. And God is right with us with the challenge to see how we respond. See, when we talk to God as Father, we address him as who he is. We know his character of love, of wisdom, and of his omnipresence. You know, omniscience, omnipresence, and, and I, by the way, I was telling the kids, I said, just think of those walls that are there. Those walls protect us from the elements outside, because it was really cold. Uh, it was before the big snow blast that, that now is in our capital of our nation. But I said, the all-powerful God is like walls around us. Nothing can get to us through his love, through his wisdom, through his all-powerfulness, omnipotence. And so... If you're sitting in your striker vehicle, blasted near death, and nobody else around you survives, and you ask why, it's so you can know the God who always loves you, know the God who always knows what's best for you, know the God who is an arm's length away from you, and know the God who is so powerful that no landmine could harm you. You survive really sweet. He said, where's that church? I said, on oh, Drake. I mean, he lives in Grand Rapids. He says, I've, I've been there. They host funerals over the years. We do. Big ones. When, when there's a big one, you know, we've, we've had law enforcement and we had soldiers. We've had funerals here. And this was, I don't know, 10 years ago. Uh, he said, I was there. I said, the God who loves you, who knows you, is an arm's length away from you and is all-powerful, spared your life. You see, that's, and, and I'm just talking about the guy I sat next to last night. That same God wants us to frame 
our work challenges, our family challenges, our home challenges. And, and you know what? When we start our day without focusing on who it is that is loving us and surrounding us and watching us and with us, then we try and figure this out and we bounce around in this, all these challenges and we get distant and we get troubled and we get anxious and we get lacking peace. Like Jeremiah said, peace removed far from me. That's a great way to put it in Lamentations. Peace removed far from me. No, I allowed my circumstances to remove me from peace. But, so that's number one. Number two, that's worship. We've already covered that. I'm just reviewing it. Secondly, following the pathway of surrendering to God. When we seek his kingdom, when we say thy kingdom come, we're surrendering to God. And surrendering to God is a choice. And by the way, it needs constant renewal. Why? Because life is like a river that is flowing in the wrong direction. Did you know all of life is flowing away from God? And we're supposed to head toward him. The world, life in this world, is a river flowing away from God. And that's just what we were born into, resisting the current of life that is always trying to sweep us away from God. Each day we don't surrender, each day we don't resist the world, each day we don't resist our flesh and don't resist the devil, we float a whole day's length away from God. Every day. That we don't focus on who he is and surrender to him. We float with the world. By the way, back to my kids, the ones I spoke to in New York. It was a room this size. And, and I, I shouldn't tell you this, but I was a youth pastor. I tricked them. I said, I have two quick questions. We're going into biblical history. I said, number one, how long was the Hundred Years' War? Instantly. Instantly. You could just see the smirk, smug looks all over the room. 109 years, 92 years, 135 years, and everyone was just laughing, and it was just everyone was trying to say anything but what? 100. I said, oh, good. I said, I have a second question. How long was the 30 Years' War that led up to the Peace of Westphalia from 1618 to 1648? How long was the 30 Years' War? Instantly the same. And after 30 seconds, I said, you have just revealed the character you have embraced of the world in which you are floating along life with. Most entertainment nowadays is sarcastic. It is bantering, mockery. That is what is funny. We tell funny things that mock. And that's, I mean, no one would say a hundred. Everyone would have laughed at the person. If I said, how long is a hundred year war? They said a hundred years. Everyone would have gone, ha, 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 Because you don't say the truth. You mock and you banter and, and on and on. I just took him right to Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 and boy did it. I said, if you don't have anything to say that is gracious seasoned with salt prompted by the Spirit, don't talk. Absolutely quiet from then on. It was unbelievable because they realized the mockers, the sarcasm purveyors had not surrendered they were floating with the world. And the sitcom mocking is what they're in, just inebriated with. They think it's funny, and the Lord doesn't. Each day we don't surrender. We float away from God, and he seems more distant. His word is more difficult to understand. His will becomes more and more unclear to us. And the joy and peace is more lacking in our lives God wants us to renew our surrender to him every day and say, I want your kingdom to come in my life. I, I want your rule. I'm going to seek you first. And we go from there to seeking fellowship with him. That's the second, look at verse 10. It's the second half of the verse. Your will be done. What is that? Fellowshipping with God is seeking his will. When we seek for his will, we're seeking for fellowship. Fellowship is part of our daily needs. Jesus said, how did he start his ministry? He said, I did not come to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He announced that when he started his ministry. He said, what I'm doing is, is what God wants me to do because I'm in complete harmony and fellowship with him. As the book of Amos said, the, the wanting of God's will is a pathway to fellowship. Can two walk together except they are agreed? Fellowship with God grows the more and more we agree with wanting to walk his way. To walk the pathway that the Lord has, we have to say, this is the pathway I want, and I want to walk in it. That's when we say, your will be done. 
What does your voice have to say about my path today? I want to hear it and do it. We're supposed to seek him first, and usually what we think of early in our day is what is most important and what shapes our day. God wants to think, us to think of him early, and he wants to dominate our days. God wants us to renew our desire to know and do his will every day. That's what fellowship, thy will be done. And then the middle is this pathway of trusting God for daily needs. When Jesus instructed us to ask for daily bread, he wasn't saying, you know, go to the bakery. He was inviting us to learn walk, to walk more and more by faith and less by sight. That's why it's daily bread. That's one of the hardest things in our culture. We're taught to, to prepare for in fact, I was talking with one couple this week, and they said their parents, financial advisor, told them that they can make it till they're 102, full tilt. They have enough. You can do anything you want till you're 102. Better die before then, you know? Cover everything. They're the American dream. I mean, they, are, they did it. They don't need day-to-day -day faith. They've got it till they're 102. Well, living by faith means trusting God more and more each day. Our faith is fed by his word. God says faith comes by hearing his word. God says finding and eating his word brings joy and rejoicing. What does Hebrews 11 say? Without faith, trusting God for our daily needs. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So the world is saying live by sight and live for sight. And God says this world is not your home. You're just passing through. You have a city in the heavens. I want you to need me every day. You can't make it through your day without me. Following the pathway of trusting God for daily needs. Next is following the pathway of avoiding sin. Look at verse 12. Forgive us our debts. What? Forgive us. When Jesus instructed us to ask God to forgive us, it's a declaration that we believe that we've sinned. His, his laws have been broken by our choices. We confess he's the one in charge and we're not. We're sinners. He's holy. We sin against him and others. And only he can cleanse that away. That's what this pathway of avoiding sin is. A decreasing frequency of, of sin, an increasing frequency of, of avoiding it by his grace. You say, how do you do that? Titus 2. The grace of God that brought salvation teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. That's paddling against the current. Each day I need to say that I choose to lay aside those besetting sins because of your grace. God wants us to love him more than our temptations that constantly come our way and God wants us to take the pathway of avoiding sin and that leads us to the first part of verse 13, it's the pathway of obeying God. Notice what verse 13 says, and do not lead us. Emphasis on lead. If we're being led, it's the pathway of obeying God. And so what we're saying is, as you lead me and throw into my box trial after trial after trial after trial, emotional and financial and relational and spiritual and every other kind, when you throw those in, I want to obey you. And I want you to lead me right out of ruinous temptation to sin and right into discovering how faithful you are. The pathway of obeying God. The only way to be delivered from the evil one who prowls around and seeks to devour us is by following the pathway God has given us. We have to obey him. We follow our faithful God away from the ruinous ditch of yielding to temptation that leads to sin. We follow our powerful God into the way of believing that he is strong and we stand against the wiles of the devil, which leads us right back to the last half of the verse 13. It's the path of humbling ourselves. It's the path of saying, it's all about you. It's not about me. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory forever. It's you. The longing of our hearts as Christ followers is that God get all the credit. We want God to get the glory. We want him to get the honor as we sang this morning, do your name. That's what we say forever. When we see ourselves in the future around the throne in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5 and Revelation 11, 
We're doing the chief end of man. We're glorifying God. We're magnifying him. So each day we make sure our life is pointing at God as our Father. Each day we make sure we're following the pathway of magnifying him, which leads us to choose to humble ourselves. Humility is a garment we put on by choice each day. The last petition is a choice to close our, clothe ourselves with humility. God wants us to follow the path of humility by returning to the one that we adore his character so much that all glory and honor is due to him. And so our Father that we focus on is the one that we humbly empty ourselves and bow before. That's the pathway. Jesus wrote it for his disciples. And he said, this is what I want you to do every day. Not mindlessly repeat this, but intentionally say, I need to worship. I need to surrender. I need to follow you. I need to trust you for what I need to make it through today. Keeping clean from all the sins against others and against you. And asking for your protection and emptying myself so that you get all the glory. Remember when the spotlight was on Daniel at the big banquet and the king called him and said, we understand you can answer this handwriting on the wall stuff. Do you remember what Daniel said? I can't, but there is a God in heaven. That's emptying ourselves. We still do the same thing. We perform for his glory. Let's all stand together. And as we stand, at the beginning, I said, we're followers of Christ or we're not. You've been thinking about that. You've been hearing about that. But are you today following Christ? Maybe at a distance. Maybe you're sporadic. <laughs> Maybe you're right on the bumper. Maybe you don't even know what that means. If you don't know what that means, you know, last week I said, hey, if you want to come know the Lord, uh, if you aren't sure you know him, there are people right here at the front. Boom, someone came right up to me. And I said, I have to go to the visual line. They said, I'll follow you. And they got there, and there were three elders. And this person said, I don't think that I know Christ. You should have seen him spring into action. One got tracks, Bible. We surrounded him shared the gospel. Did you know if you'd like to make sure that you know the God who's only an arm's length away, he's here, he's in your box, he's in your striker vehicle, and he would like to make sense of everything happening to you, but the first way is to get your eyes opened when you call out to him by faith and say, I'm a sinner, I want my own way, you died for sinners, I want a new heart and you start coming to know your Father in heaven. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, I pray that you would help us to truly follow you more each day, to focus on who you are, your character revealed in your word, and then accept your grace that will help us in our times of need to stay on the pathway that you want to show us. Because in your presence, there's fullness of joy and at your right hand, when we arrive to be with you forever, there are endless pleasures. And I pray for any that don't understand that, that you would draw them to yourself this morning, and the godly men and women here at the front would be able to pray with them, or right where they're sitting, that they would, even now with heads bowed, reach out to you by faith. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Help us to follow you. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.